Hello and welcome to the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Professor Michael Rechtenwald. Professor Michael Rechtenwald is the author of 12 books, including The Great Reset and The Trust Struggle for Liberty, Unraveling the Global Agenda, Thought Criminal, a novel, Beyond Woke, and my favorite, Google Archipelago, The Digital Gulag and the Simulation of Freedom. And I wanted to discuss some of these works today. Dr. Rechtenwald also ran for president on the, for the Libertarian Party ticket recently. He you grew up as a leftist Marxist, and he was a professor at NYU University. And then at a certain point in his life, he saw the light and became a libertarian. I met Dr. Rechtenwald at a Mises University in event in New York about maybe four years ago, I think, or yeah. five years ago, something like that. And I enjoyed chatting with him, so I'm very delighted to have him on the podcast. Thank you for joining us. That's well, great to be here. Thanks for having me, Saverdeen. Let's begin with your background before you, we get into your work. Uh, how did mm -hmm. you become an academic, and then how did you become a Marxist? <laughs> well, they're sort of synonymous, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I was a student of literature and so forth, and as an undergraduate, actually, I was first a pre-med student, then a student of literature, and then after uh, my undergraduate work, I went into advertising for about nine years and got very burned out by that career and went, went back to graduate school. By the time I went back to graduate school uh, in English, uh, everything had changed uh, within the academy. The, um, you could say that the, uh, the invasion of theory had taken place. And by theory, of course, they're referring to I'm referring to uh, Marxist, post-Marxist, neo-Marxist, uh, post-modernist, uh, feminist, and all these kinds of uh, left-wing theories. And uh, so in the course of my education in, in, in the graduate program, I mean, they were just, uh, I mean, I had agency here, of course, but uh, there was a constant inundation of all, all of this left leftist theory and uh, before you know it, I, I became sort of uh, drawn in and uh, I, I became a Marxist because it seemed to be the one particular leftist theory that I could that I could um, that I could grasp onto because the other ones were exclusive often for uh, to various identity groups like queer theory or feminist theory and other types of identity-based uh, theoretical positions. And Marxism uh, was different in that it, it, it was dependent not upon your identity per se, but as they would put it, I guess, your subject position. And by that, they mean sort of like your place in the socioeconomic order. And likewise, Marxism seemed to make sense to me. And uh, and, uh, you know, it, it sort of answered some things that I had thought were uh, problematic, if you, as it were, like, <clears throat> you know, like the corporate world was a real hellhole. Um, I, I didn't like it very much. And I didn't like the, the, the regimentation and the, uh, the sort of uh, the kind of brainwashing that went on. And I ascribed this, of course, to capitalism per se. Uh, un unbeknownst to me, this was not capitalism at the time. I didn't know this, that is. And uh, so, you know, a lot of those kind of factors played into it. And, uh, you know, I had a sort of uh, working class background. I grew up in Pittsburgh's north side. Uh, my father was an independent uh, contractor uh, doing um, like home renovations and construction. And... Uh, so I had a bit of a class chip on my shoulder, and so this played right into it. And uh, so that's how I got more or less drawn into Marxism. Plus, it, it gave you good – there was some grist for the intellectual mill uh, to be had there. And that is, you, you could at least give yourself the, the idea that you, were make, that you were engaged in some sort of rigorous intellectual pursuit. So that's basically how that happened, and then – uh, the rest is history in terms of what happened <laughs> at NYU. And uh, I finally ended up as a professor at NYU after my graduate studies and a tour through North Carolina where I taught at uh, North Carolina Central University and Duke and then ended up at NYU. 
And uh, at that j- juncture, and that, that's the part I've written about pretty extensively, what happened at NYU with uh, sort of the thought police coming after me. Yes, that's what we wanted to get into. So that was, uh, so I'd, I'd say you were, you obviously had been uh, recovering from Marxism before they came after you, right? It didn't spark the. Yeah, that's correct. I started recovering from Marxism before they came after me. In fact, there was a moment in history in the time where I, I was standing outside of uh, my hotel room in New York because I actually ended up living in a hotel. <laughs> Um, because it became easier to live in a hotel and commute uh, from Pittsburgh uh, three days a week than it was to live in New York City. And I thought to myself, if I express the thoughts that I'm having in my head, all hell is going to break loose. And uh, because as an NYU, yes, it did. As an NYU professor to have entertained these kinds of thoughts was, was, uh, was criminal, really. Uh, was these were thought crimes that I started to have. And then I started letting them out through this Twitter account, which was then the uh, called Anti-PCNYU-Prof, and uh, started tweeting about that stuff. And uh, before you know it, uh, the student newspaper picked up on this account, asked me to interview for the, uh, with them, and I did this interview as myself, because this account had been... Uh, anonymous at this point. So I did this interview as myself and I let it all rip. And that was the uh, beginning of the end at NYU for me. Yeah. So what was the, uh, what was the gist of your heresy? (laughs) Well, I was talking about uh, the, uh, there was a lot of developments on that were taking place. For example, the university had just instituted this thing called the bias reporting hotline. And, and this was a hotline where students could report on the bias infractions and microaggressions or other types of infractions of their professors to the administration. I thought this was like a, a Stasi state being established. And I said so. And uh, they were, also, I found it very disturbing the way they were no, no platforming speakers, uh, the way they were uh, hysterically establishing things like safe spaces. Uh, don't forget that this was all happening concurrent with the um, election uh, between uh, Trump and Clinton. So all of these people went into hysterics, and I started to rip on it. And they associated me with Trump and assumed I was a deplorable. I actually did call uh, that Twitter account. The handle was anti-PCNYU prof, but I called myself the deplorable NYU professor. (laughs) More like in solidarity with the um, flyover states and people that, you know, were consigned to this basket of deplorables by Hillary Clinton. It really wasn't about Trump it was really about the way I despised this elite and the way they were, uh, you know, treating the mass, the majority of people in the country. So, yeah, that uh, those were the kind of issues I was tweeting about and uh, that I ripped on in the uh, in the interview. Yeah, and then uh, that obviously didn't uh, go down well with the Stasi. So <laughs> what happened then? Well, uh, two days after this interview came out in the student newspaper, uh, I was called into the dean's office and, uh, and I didn't know, little did I know that the head of human resources would also be there. And I walked into the dean's office and he pulled me really close to him as we shook hands and he goes, I just want you to know that this, this meeting has nothing to do with your interview or Twitter account. Um, and then this, the head of human resources was brought in and they proceeded to tell me that it was about the Twitter account and the interview. And they said that we think, um, you need help. Uh, they, they said that, that we think you may be suffering from a mental breakdown or something. <laughs> and so, <laughs> because you have to be crazy to, to question these orthodoxies and, uh, and then at the same time as this, inter- as this meeting was going on, little did I know the paper had published 
a, a condemnation of me, an open letter condemnation in which they literally said that I was, quote, guilty for the structure and content of my thinking. Guilty for the co- structure and content of my thinking. Wow. Yeah. And and let's so, be, let's be clear here. Like it wasn't it wasn't as if you were saying anything that is um, truly controversial in an intellectual sense. Like I mean, you were just describing the intellectual climate. Uh, so so yeah. it, it, it wasn't as if you were holding some kind of crazy beliefs that uh, would actually be controversial. You weren't out there saying. Uh, things that most people would truly find objectionable. You were mostly discussing the uh, structure of academics and academic organizations and yes. their use of these lofty ideals and banners in order to promote essentially totalitarianism. That's right. I was talking about uh, identity politics. I was talking about censorship. I was talking about um, policing, thought policing, surveillance technologies, which the bias reporting hotline represented. I was talking about things that were real. I wasn't saying things about like the lizard people or (laughs) anything like that. These were very, you know, honed remarks. In fact, I had written an essay in the summer before about uh, bias reporting hotlines uh, and uh, some of the other techniques of surveillance. I actually wrote it from a kind of a Foucauldian perspective, that is like my, my, Michel Foucault, I, I, took, I took a lot of leftist uh, thought and I twisted it and turned it back on the left itself. Yeah. This is, I think, an enormously uh, interesting thing that you do, which I always found uh, very fascinating. And I think it's one of those, um, one of those just uh, widely accepted biases that people don't accept because it's just the way that the Overton window is structured. And you see this with leftist movements throughout history, which is, I, I mean, just to look at the most obvious and uh, most high-profile example, the communist revolution in Russia. If you read about the time of the Tsar, uh, it's presented as if it was just this absolutely horrific, awful uh, regime that was out there massacring and murdering people. And yes, of course, the Tsar was bad in many ways. I think looking back, uh, you, you could definitely fault a lot of what the Tsar did and it was truly uh, indefensible. I'm not trying to defend many of the things that he did, but <laughs> all of the <laughs> things that he did were a weekend for Stalin and uh, his pals. And um, yeah. yeah, it was a weekend's work. Basically, all of the violence that happened from the 1905 revolution to 1917 uh, by the Tsar and the Tsar's forces is probably a week's work for Stalin and his buddies. And it's absolutely astonishing to me just how nobody ever turns and applies the same critique that was being given to the Tsar to the communists. It's amazing how that's just switched off when it's the Tsar, when it's the enemy of the leftists. He's held up to the standards that are just impossible. He has to be a complete angel or else we need to take down everything. We need to destroy everything. We need to destroy private property, we need to destroy the family, we need to destroy the church, we need to destroy the monarchy, (laughs) because he was imperfect. But then once we've done all these things, and we're left with the, uh, you know, the the new Bolsheviks who own everything and rule everyone and are murdering everybody, then there is none of this, all of these standards go out of the window. And it's just, well, they've got nice sounding ideals about workers and equality and uh, liberation and stuff. So you can't, fault their actions when they have the right noises. (laughs) It's incredible. I mean, I I delved, that's one of the first things I did when I came out of the stupor, if you will, or the ideological blinkers that had been pasted to my inner eye. Um, I, I started to deep, take a deep dive into leftist criminality, political criminality. And, um, shockingly, I mean, you know, I had known, the figures and all that, but there's something more to it than just numbers. When you talk about the gruesomeness of what they did uh, and the things that it caused, for example, in the Halamador, I mean, we're talking about people eating other people. We had cannibalism they had to resort to. There was mass starvation. Uh, There was mass theft of peasants' peasants', uh, agricultural goods. I mean, it was just insane. And all of this is completely airbrushed over 
So it, it took a deep dive into what's called the Stalinist Digital Archive, uh, which I did. That was one of the first things that I did and started to read about this stuff. And there's, you know, there are some decent histories, but they're effectively buried. Uh, and the, even in the university's, um, you know, um, academic um, uh, uh, bibliotheca, their 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 ref in their libraries, their digital libraries, you can't find a lot of these things. Like I tried to search for uh, auto critique or auto uh, self criticism and uh, struggle sessions with reference to China, and there was nothing, nothing in the academic uh, libraries. Yeah. So then um, that led you to study, studying more of this stuff, obviously cured you from your Marxism when you start uh, judging yeah. Marxists by what they do and not what they say. <laughs> Things are very, very, very different. Yeah. I started to judge them by what they do and realized that the greatest political villainy in history uh, is chalked up, is, can be chalked up uh, to communist regimes, um, and uh, without a question, it's unparalleled. Uh, it's beyond beyond comparison, really. And uh, then uh, it didn't take me long to then get into. So I started off with a criticism of the totalitarianism, and then I started to get into the economic theory, and that's what brought me around to um, to libertarianism. Um, the first book I read was by Mises. I mean, the first book in the Austrian uh, camp was Mises, uh, his book, uh, Socialism and, and Economic and Sociological Analysis. And that book just blew the doors right off of it. It was like, I felt like I had been let out of a cage. Uh, like I had been let out of a cage. Uh, I won't say any comparisons because they won't be apt. But it was like I was uh, released from prison, and uh, and then it just was a an excursion then from from Mises into you know further into Mises and then eventually into Rothbard and then Hoppe and others and the whole whole cadre of libertarian thought. Okay, so uh, what are your impressions? Why would you call yourself a libertarian now? And how do you reconcile this shift? I, I should say, I mean, what is it that changed? If we wanted to dial in on it, what do you think it is that changed to make you go from being, because I presume a lot of your values stayed constant. So it was really more about the information of the things that you learned, or was it values? What do you think? Well, I have to say, when looking back at my history, I was a bit of an authoritarian. Uh, I remember thinking such things as people that eat too much should be thrown off the insurance rolls and things like that. Uh, and uh, people that smoke, and here I am puffing on a vape, <laughs> people that smoke should be thrown off the insurance, well, things like that. But I think that the, when, you know, let's put it, I'll encapsulate it like this. The Soviet Union had slaves. I mean, if that, if that doesn't tell you everything about socialism, nothing else will. They actually had slavery uh, in the gulag system. So um, everything that they claimed about human liberation uh, and the freedom from wage slavery and all that was belied by the facts that they actually maintained a system of slavery. And, uh, and then I just realized, you know, getting into... The economics, um, it, it became clear to me that uh, there was no possibility for wealth production without private property, and uh, that without private property, you can't produce wealth, and that really socialism, you know, they, they build it as the solution to capitalism, but it's always the reverse of what they say. Capitalism is always the solution to what they do. Um, so, you know, socialism is built as the sequel uh, the necessary sequel uh, to capitalism, whereas it's always the uh, it's the exact opposite. It's the only thing that um, pulls out countries from their their storehouse of misery uh, that they produce in the process of a trying to establish socialist or communist states. Uh, so, uh, you know, a lot of history informed my thinking, and a lot of theoretical. 
uh, breakthroughs in my mind, informed my thinking. Values, I would say, I always believed in uh, freedom, but for for Marxism, freedom was considered freedom from necessity. That's exactly what Marx was a- after. Uh, he believed that that socialism represented, or co- socialism, communism, and I'll, I'll put them in a hyphenated form because it's a long story, as you know. Socialism, communism represented freedom from necessity. Well, there is no such thing. <laughs> There's no such thing as freedom from necessity because scarcity is the is the starting point for all economics. So. Uh, there's no way to get freedom from necessity, and what that meant really was uh, uh, subjugation uh, and the loss of your uh, self-possession. Uh, instantly, uh, you lose possession of yourself, which is the first principle, I think, of libertarianism is self-ownership. So self-ownership became primary in my mind. And then all of the things about censorship and the use of my own ideas and thoughts to say things were all connected to this idea of self-ownership. If I don't own myself, uh, I can't say what I think. I can't do what I would do with, you know, without violating anybody's rights, of course, without uh, trespassing the non-aggression principle. Uh, but I can't express myself. I can't do anything. So all of the um, restrictions that were they attempted to impose on me at the university and through subtle coercion uh, in the whole leftist milieus in which I was involved, including a communist group that put me on a show trial after after all of this <laughs> took place. They, they had a cyber show trial in which they convicted me of wrong thinking as well. And, you know, this was like a whole, the whole left came down on me like a ton of bricks. and. Uh, uh, all of my associates, everybody. So uh, when I realized that it, this was all because I could not use my own mind, body, and mouth and, you know, writing skills to say what I wanted to, uh, it meant that my self-ownership was being abrogated. Principles of Economics, My Complete Guide to Understanding Economics is now available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook from safeddean.com, Amazon, and many more booksellers worldwide. And now I am also teaching a course based on this book on my website, safeddean.com. Principles of Economics will run the whole academic year from September to June and will have a new lecture every two weeks, as well as weekly live online discussion seminars open to learners from all over the world and from all walks of life. Whether you're a student, a professional, or a retiree, you are making economic decisions every day, and this course will arm you with the wisdom of centuries of economists to improve your economic decision-making. You'll also get a free book of Principles of Economics if you sign up for the course. Go to safeddean.com and sign up now. Yeah, I think there are a lot of reasons that you could uh, disagree with Marxism uh, for there are a lot of problems with the practice and the implementation of Marxism. There are a lot of theoretical problems with the ways in which Marxism seeks to be implemented. But I really think the most searing and most powerful and completely irrefutable critique of Marxism and socialism in general is not related to any of those things. It's exactly the one you mentioned in the book by Mises, which is that socialism without property rights it cannot calculate and it's a purely positive um it's a purely positive argument in the sense that it is not out there saying you should do this or you should do that it's not arguing from the pers- from the perspective of what is desirable for us as a society it's just simply laying out the idea that in order for people to be able to perform economic calculation they need to own the property that they are deciding to allocate. If they don't own it, if there's no real opportunity cost to its use, they aren't able to decide how to best use it. And it doesn't matter how good their intentions are, and it doesn't matter how good they are at their math, without property, there is no real cost. And without real cost, there is no possibility for calculation. And without calculation, economic production comes crumbling down. This is really the key point. And this is something that I think the vast majority of leftists, if you were to ask them, 
they are completely unfamiliar with this idea. When they think of capitalist critiques of Marxism and socialism, they think purely in terms of things like uh, these people are greedy, they want to have a lot of money, they think that socialism will make them poor, and they're just being selfish, they like their stuff. And if they're being a little bit more generous, they'll tell you that the problem people have with Marxism is the problem of incentives, that they think that everybody is selfish and lazy, and so therefore nobody's going to want to do the hard jobs, nobody's going to want to do the uh, difficult jobs, uh, everybody's going to want to do the sitting in an air-conditioned office uh, typing out emails, jobs, and then production falls apart. And this is, I think there is some truth to it, but I don't think that it is the main problem with socialism. And as uh, as Rothbard says, the Soviet Union managed to solve the incentive problem probably better than the capitalists did, because if you didn't do your job, you were sent to the gulag. Now, getting rich is a positive incentive for people, but staying out of the gulag is a much stronger incentive, I think, than even getting rich. So I don't think, uh, and if you look at the problems, uh, the economic problems of the Soviet Union and socialist economies, absenteeism was not usually one of them. The Soviet Union didn't collapse because of absenteeism, because people just didn't turn up for work. People still turned up for work because they didn't want to get shipped off to the gulag, and yet still they turned up to factories that weren't running because they were missing key components. There were key widgets in the machines that were missing. There were key ingredients of the products that couldn't be found. And they couldn't be found because there was no market in the factors of production because all the factors of production are owned by the same entity. And that entity is the buyer and the seller in every transaction. And therefore, it sets the price. And therefore, it doesn't have the ability of performing rational economic calculation. And that's really the thing that the vast majority of leftists, I think, have not contended with because... No, I haven't. really believe that if you're a leftist and you read this, there's no coming back. And, no, uh, that's what happened with me when I read in that book. And so, you know, he has a version of the calculation problem in there, in the in socialism and economic and sociological analysis. And that was like that's it. And that basically that's it. I mean, it wasn't about as he says. It's not it's not an argument about human nature. It's not an argument about. Um, uh, the desirability, and it's not even a it's not even a normative argument. It's simply a, a descriptive analytical argument, which totally undermines the whole enterprise. Yeah, I think this is really a key point to keep in mind here, and it's it's uh, it's it, 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 it's fascinating to look at the uh, way that this discussion around calculation evolved over the past century. This book was written in 1921 or 22, something like that. It was one right. of Mises' early books, and it was written at a time. I think this is this is a point most people miss. In 1921 and 22, if you were somebody who managed to read, particularly outside of Europe, uh, the vast majority of intellectuals in the world at that point were all leftists and Marxists. More Marxists. This was it. If you were in, in Russia or China or the Middle East or Latin America, there is an enormous number of leftist and Marxist revolutionaries in all of those places, and so. The intellectual tide was very much in favor of leftism and socialism at that time. And for Mises to write this analysis is truly remarkable because if you read it without me telling you that, you'd think, all right, well, this guy obviously saw the 1980s in Russia or the 1970s in Cambodia, and he's writing about that. No, he was writing in 1922 when the vast majority of economists around the world were telling you that the Soviet Union is going to continue to overtake the United, to continue to rise and eventually overtake the United States because they have a much more efficient economy because they don't waste their resources on silly consumerist things. They dedicate their resources to rationally decided things by uh, smart planners who know how to dedicate the resources. Now, the really interesting thing, there's a great paper by Rothbard on this. It's called uh, Mises and the, so no, it's, I think it's called the Socialist, the Socialist Calculation Debate Revisited. Mm, mm -hmm. Or maybe Mises and the Socialist Calculation Debate. No, I think it's the Socialist Calculation or the Economic Calculation Debate Revisited. It was one of Rothbard's last papers written in the 90s. And he summarizes the main idea of Mises, but then he also summarizes the intellectual debate over the uh, 70 years that follow. And it's really fascinating because when the early Marxists read Mises' critique, some of them did manage to read it. It definitely 
it definitely, definitely left a mark. Uh, it, they definitely paid attention to it to the point that one of the foremost economists, uh, his name is Oscar Lang, he uh, said that once the revolution succeeds and the National Economic Bureau has succeeded in uh, bringing about communism and ending scarcity, we should build a statue for Ludwig von Mises <laughs> for having pointed us at the problem that socialism would have had and allowed us to make the rational uh, ways of fixing it in order to make socialism work. So it definitely struck with them and they did get the point that, okay, he kind of does have a point without a market in the, in, in the goods, in the capital goods industry, we are not going to be able to have a rational way of allocating resources. So then they started designing, uh, they started coming up for solutions for that, or they thought that they could come up with solutions for that. And so they devised mechanisms for trying to have opinion surveys, I think it was, or all kinds mm -hmm. of ways to replace the market so yeah. that they could uh, figure right. out the allocation or try and figure out what people actually want from the market. And of course, Mises would respond and tell them, and I have one of his favorite quotes is, you cannot play markets like children play war or train sets. This is what the Marxists are doing. They are think mm -hmm. that prices and markets and economic calculation are like children's play, that they can just be replicated. They're like children playing yeah. with fake guns and thinking this is war. If the person is not actually making the economic calculation over their property, they're not making economic calculation. It's completely right. irrelevant. It's, it's, fa it's fake. And they're now, they're, to this day, uh, there are socialists, and I keep tabs on them just because it's a curiosity, who believe that the calculation problem can be solved with AI and uh, that AI will be able to dic dictate prices based on some sort of calculation of all, all demand and all allocations of goods and so forth. Um, uh, pa Paul Cockshot is the guy, is the socialist who's looking into this, who's been writing about this incessantly for years. Uh, Cockshot, a British guy, and uh, you know he thinks he has it solved through AI. Yeah, um, I'm not holding my breath because also if you read the Rothbard, if you read Mises on this, you'll see that this is a constant running theme since the rise of socialism in the early 20th century, that there was always this uh, idea that we are on the cusp of the computing revolution that is going to mm -hmm. make this calculation problem possible. Every single generation, AI, it, now it's AI, a few years ago it was big data, a few years yeah. before that it was uh, uh, well, all kinds of different you know, fads that come into economics from mathematics. So regression right. analysis at a certain point, Excel was a big one. So just <laughs> put a lot of hopes in that one. <laughs> We're going to fix it. There was dynamic stochastic general equilibrium modeling. Few people remember that one. But for a, well, I mean, I think they still do remember that one in economics departments. In macroeconomics, they still teach that uh, garbage. But it's been a constant uh, since the first uh, um, computer machines since the first calculators were invented, it was always, oh, wow, look, we now have sophisticated machines. Now we can figure out how to allocate every single last apple in our economy so that we can get the most productivity, the most apples given to most people. Every single one of them fails, and it doesn't matter how much computing power you have, even if the world had one million times the computing power that we have today. It does not change the problem because it's not a computing power problem. It is a private property problem. It's right. about the person being able to figure out the opportunity cost of their choice. And for that to be calculable, the choice has to have real world implications, which can mm -hmm. only be manifested in property. You have to make money if you allocate it correctly, and you have to lose money if you don't allocate it correctly. You need to think of that as the feedback mechanism that allows the business to function. And if you just impute that feedback mechanism, the business cannot function anymore. Yeah. I mean, the way I read it, too, is that uh, the these ideas really would eventually seed, uh, C-E-D-E, -E, they would seed 
uh, consumption choices to AI, in effect, so that AI would be deciding what, what was purchased rather than individuals. And likewise, allocations would be made based on AI decisions rather than individual choice and ranking. Um, so it, it, it turns out to be just the same old statism in the end uh, when you have AI just basically taking the place of the bureaucrat, in effect. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. I, and, and I mean, I think, um, uh, <laughs> I think the real scam here in AI is that they're trying to make it look like it's just going to be something that is just intelligence that is devoid of any human agency. That, well, the computer chose that you are going to have to eat. Uh, <laughs> the computer figured yeah. out that it's better for you that you should be eating a diet yeah. of bugs. I, I worked in AI for five years. I wasn't a programmer, but I wrote about AI programs. Uh, in the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon while I was finishing my dissertation. Uh -huh. uh, another story, but it, one of the things that people don't recognize that AI is, de is programmed by people with their own values and their own uh, ideological predispositions and propensities. And in fact, they create um, AI after their own image and likeness, really. Yeah, absolutely. I think, the, the, as I was trying to say, it's trying to pass off the agenda of the programmers as if it is just... It, as it is. Yeah. It's, it's just intelligence. Like it, it, It's not up to you to decide what is better for you. You have a limited brain. We have this magical brain. And look, lo and behold, it decides that what your government is saying is actually true and <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea what you're talking about and you should just listen to the government. Yeah, exactly. This is what it's like. Yeah. Yeah, it's very much like that. Yeah, so so now, now tell us about your book the Google Archipelago. Uh, Google Archipelago. So, you know, I before the book before that was Springtime for Snowflakes and um uh -huh. in in that book I detailed uh, a chronology and a history of my entrance into academia and indoctrination into leftism and then my escape from it. And then I started noticing that the same ideology that pervaded academia was actually pervading big tech. And so I wanted to investigate that. And in fact, uh, what I did was basically extend that study into the study of big tech and saw uh, that now what they were doing was in effect reifying, as it were, the ideological pretend, you know, propensities uh, of the same creed. Uh, the creed being like social justice or whatever you want to call it. And uh, so, yeah, that book is uh, it's an exploration of uh, of big tech in terms of. Uh, the, you know, not only its surveillance and its, uh, uh, its uh, censorship and its uh, control of information, curation of reality really is what it comes down to uh, by Google and, and its auxiliaries. It's, uh, it's about the ideological uh, bent of big tech. And uh, so I did some analysis in terms of histories of uh, corporate socialism, uh, which I found in some precursors like uh, King Camp Gillette in the uh, early 20th century. This guy that invented the uh, Gillette Razor Company was actually a corporate socialist. And so I, I saw that this was exactly the same kind of model these people were working under, a kind of corporate socialism, uh, which is the way I define it is the way that it was defined by Anthony uh, C. Sutton and uh, in his books, uh, his trilogy on um, uh, his trilogies on um, corporate socialism. Yeah, that's right. Wall Street and, and socialism, Wall Street and Nazism and Wall Street and FDR. Those are that's the three right. books by Anthony Sutton, highly recommended. Yeah, that's so I sort of took that model and, and I, I saw that same model being replicated through big tech and uh, 
And I, I argued in that book that, in fact, speaking to the idea that programmers really establish the character of what they produce, that embedded in the deep neural networks of um, of big tech and its products is this particular socialist, social justice, corporate socialist ideology. It's actually coded into the into the actual workings of of big tech, and uh, this is very evident now. That came out with uh, what we saw with the Twitter files and uh, Missouri versus Biden and Kennedy versus. Biden and other lawsuits that, in fact, big tech is event is very much so a leftist or, uh, set of organizations. Yeah, and I think when you wrote this in 2019, I'd say the vast majority of people didn't really care about this as much as they cared about it now. Because right. thinking back at 2019, but yes, of course, there's some censorship on the internet. I wrote it too early. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess, but uh, it, it probably uh, a, a lot of people probably picked it up in 2020 during their lockdowns, and uh, it, it it clicked a few things in their in their mind. Because, uh, as I was saying, in 2019, this was you would have thought, okay, well, yeah, they got surveillance, but I'd say the vast majority of people thought, well, they're out there stopping people from posting child porn from posting really extreme political ideals. As long as you're law-abiding, then you don't have much to care about. And then 2020 comes around and slaps you straight in the face and tells you, no, 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 you need to be caring about this because, um, well, in 2020, you could just say that, hey, I took this thing and it made me feel better uh, and it alleviated my symptoms, and you would be sent to the digital gulag yeah uh, gulag yeah. to the digital gulag yeah. it was the end of it i mean and, and you saw so many doctors just get completely memory hold like these doctors would turn up and say hey i've been treating patients for this and then boom, all over social media everything gets destroyed their youtube videos are all taken out their f facebook profiles their twitter profiles everything gets nuked all across the social media and then they just disappear and it continued happening i mean there were obviously several prominent cases and if for every case you've heard about, there are probably another 10 or 20 you never mm -hmm. heard about because that's what uh, they the, disappeared them. The digital, yeah. uh, the digital gulag does. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. This podcast is also brought to you by the Bitcoin way your professional Bitcoin IT team, offering you personalized, secure, and comprehensive solutions for every step along your Bitcoin journey. The Bitcoin Way offer live concierge service to guide you with your Bitcoin cold storage, running your node, privacy best practices, inheritance planning, corporate strategy, and multi-sig solutions. They don't touch your coins, they guide you through the process of acquiring your coins and securing them. If you'd like to make your setup safer and more reliable, book a consult with them and see what they have to suggest. If you want to give someone the gift of Bitcoin, get them this professional service that will ensure they start off knowing exactly how to manage their coins and not lose them. Go to thebitcoinway.com and start Bitcoining more confidently. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on how this is heading and uh, how this is moving, where it is going? Do you see this getting better or worse over time? Well, I think uh, I, th I, th I said in a couple essays that I wrote for the Mises Institute, The Wire there, that I think that the uh, test case is really X or t what was once Twitter and uh, whether Twitter can prevail against or X can prevail against the headwinds of censorship and information control and reality curation whether in fact x could prevail would mean a lot not that it, 
X is the only place to express oneself, but I thought it was a kind of a good test case scenario. And, um, you know, we just found out yesterday that the EU, the EC, European Commission uh, executive clown, uh, Thierry Breton, just issued a warning to, to Musk effectively saying, look, you're going to curtail this. You're going to curtail speech, or we're going to we're going to crush you. And I don't know what the power they have. Uh, they say they can levy fines. They they called uh, activity going on X illegal, and uh, that this is illegal and it's criminal. And then therefore, if Musk is not doing something to uh, forbid it, this is uh, he's an, effectively an accessory to crime. Um, so here we have a, a globalist uh, s- sort of supra-statist organization dictating or attempting to dictate the terms of expression on a, on a platform across the whole globe, inclusive of places uh, that have constitutional rights to free speech. It's, it's astounding. Uh, so I'm just waiting to see how this kind of plays out, whether the Digital Services Act has the effect that they intend it to have. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I think it's uh, it's it's becoming clearer and clearer that it's going to be it's go the, the net is going to be tightening from where I can see it. I think there was um the, 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 there was some hope around X that people are going to do it and I think to his credit obviously Elon Musk has done a good job uh, in um allowing a lot more voices to come on X. So there's still, obviously, the, the, the algorithms are still playing around and they're manipulating yeah, favored uh, uh, narratives at the expense of other narratives. And Musk made that clear. They said, you know, freedom of speech does not mean freedom of reach, right? which is code for we are going to promote people who think regime talking points and exactly and i think you saw that in particular with um i i would say with the, the palestine israel the gaza conflict i think that was uh, of course the lead one yeah i mean look at uh, musk promoting people yeah musk promoting literally retweeting people like gad sad uh and uh others like this peterson of course and gad sad who's like a listen this guy was putatively a friend of mine uh, still on a particular email list of dissident, so-called dissident professors, <laughs> along with Jordan Peterson. We, we see how dissident they are now. Yeah. Total fraud. Yeah, I think a lot of the, uh, the I mean, a lot of these whole uh, freedom of speech movement uh, that was just out there talking about the horror, horrors of uh, restriction of speech on the left. And I think, you know, there are a lot of terrible things on the left, but uh I think it was very aptly expressed that Israel is uh, identity politics and uh, social justice warriors for the right. And it's the all right. those people it's- who were so uh, offended about suppressing speech because of um, leftist ideas are suddenly completely <laughs> on a very different page when it comes to the issue of Israel and Palestine. Yeah, they're calling for yeah, they're calling for cancellations. I mean, Zionism is 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 right wing wokeism, really. Is really exactly wokeism. in our terms, at least from this standpoint. I'm not saying that's all it is by any stretch, but that's what it is as it plays out. In- it's nowhere near as innocuous as wokeism. I mean, at the end of the yeah, day, yeah, that's true. They're not yet, at least, coming with guns to your home and uh, taking your kids to sterilize them. At least not yet. Um, so they've got that going over the Zionists. But yeah, it, 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 yeah, that's why I said it's. It, 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 I'm talking about from from this perspective of speech in the U.S. in the connection with like big tech. It's it's right wing uh, wokeism, but it's a hell of a lot more than that, as we know. All you have to do is look at the horrific scenes coming out of Palestine and and Israel out of their out of their prison camps their concentration camps uh unbelievable un- unbelievable and uh they call that western civilization yeah no i mean i think it's uh it's when you put it this way i think it's it's really doing a disservice for western civilization to be associated with zionism and i say this as somebody who grew up with a constant diet of 
Western civilization bad, Europeans bad, the white people bad, they're just colonialists and they're out there uh, going out on the world, all over the world and uh, doing the same thing that they're doing to you as a Palestinian. But then, you know, you realize a lot of that is a ridiculous hyperbole. Colonialism is very different from Zionism. I think this comparison of Zionism to colonialism or white racism or white supremacism, it's, it's just completely nonsensical. Uh, the vast majority of colonial projects, think uh, Britain in India, France in Algeria, they were uh, at no point did the British say we need to make a national homeland for people who are not Indian in India. At no point did the <laughs> yeah. French say we are going to get rid of the Algerians and just colonize it for the French. We're not going to destroy Algerian society. You could have been an Algerian or an Indian through colonization. Your family could have survived uh, dozens or hundreds of years in that country and their property right wouldn't have been overruled by the colonizers. So right. it's a really very different experience. And I think even when you think of the um, Western hemisphere, the new world, people like to compare Palestine to the new world and say, well, this is just Western civilization doing their thing. I disagree. I, I have, it's, it's a very contentious position that I have, but I think it's very different because when European settlers came to North America, they came to a land that was predominantly uh, the, the unowned in the sense that there was no yeah. private property rights system. So it was people moving around and nomadic tribes moving around and there was no clear property in land. So it was entirely possible for people from that land, the indigenous natives of that land, to be moving around from one spot to the other. And so a bunch of people cross the pond and arrive there. And I would say, I, I, I mean, I'm not very familiar with the history, but I think a significant if not the majority of the early settlements were built on empty land. They did not take land from people. They did not kill people to take their land. Conflicts did happen. Some of that did happen. Of course, there was a lot of land taking. There was a lot of land theft. There was terrible things that were happening. But that was not primarily how right. the U.S. was settled. And this is a deeply unpopular thing to say. But the difference is that in the case of Palestine, there was a property rights system that extended for hundreds of years. And it was a property rights system that was a lot better than the current one that we have right now, because back then anybody could own land, as evidenced by the fact that a lot of Jewish European migrants came to Palestine and bought land, because there was a right. lot of land uh, there and people were buying and selling land. And in the 19th and early 20th century, people had no reason to not sell land to Jewish people because the Jewish people had always lived in Palestine. Right. So you did have a land market. You did have a system of property rights. You did have a system of private property that owned the majority of land in Palestine. Some of the land was not privately owned, which is the desert in the south, something like 40% of the country was not privately owned, but that was desert in the south. I mean, effectively, you could say that it was owned by the tribes that were there. But the majority of the country, where the majority of the populations, both Palestinian and Israeli, live, was privately owned. And the majority of it was stolen from owners who have land deeds, who lived in those lands. So it is very different. So I don't think it's, it, it, it's fair to um, characterize all of Western civilization with uh, Zionism right. based on their colonial right. records. Right. It is becoming fair to do it now, though, based on their support of Israel, though. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, th what I meant by they call it Western civilization is that these people that are uh, like Sad and others that are defending this are saying that it's the it's a clash of civilizations or it's Western civilization versus barbarity while, while exhibiting the most barbarous traits imaginable uh, while the Zionists... Uh, you know, exhibit the most barbaric traits imaginable. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing how this uh, inversing is, is, I mean, it's just, uh, the, they've normalized the idea that pretty much anything Israel does is justifiable because of whatever any a Palestinian does, and nothing any Palestinian can do is ever justifiable. And so Israel can torture people. That they've got gulags with tens of thousands of people. The only reason they release their prisoners is that they don't have enough capacity to keep locking right. people and up. They're talking about shooting them now. Yeah, they're talking about shooting ben, them. Ben Gavir them. said, 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 said this, we're going to have to start assassinating them to make room. 
Yeah, it's it's incredible. It's incredible. I mean, they're talking about kicking people out of their homes, taking over Gaza and settling it and eradicating the Palestinians from there. And people just cheer along. That's just your run-of-the-mill self-defense. Um, and, of course, Palestinians don't get that privilege of self-defense because people are just brainwashed to think that way. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I've had to, I know that you debated Walter Block on this, and I watched that with great interest since I've gotten myself involved with a debate <laughs> in a series of essays with him. It's I have to extricate myself from it because there's no found there's no first principles with him here, and uh, I don't know what happens to his so-called libertarianism in the face of all this. It's completely abrogated. Like he. He talks about, um, you know, he, he takes a uh, classical liberal position uh, with reference to Israel as opposed to his su supposed anarcho-capitalism elsewhere. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it's worth it. Uh, you could probably tell me whether it's worth it. <laughs> I don't think it is worth it. Um, I, I wouldn't engage with him anymore. Um, yeah. He sent me an email. Um, I think a lot of these people, what they do is they like to engage in um, trying to whitewash their guilt by trying to just continue. Yes, legitimating it through discourse. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just a waste of time. You're just engaging in uh, – you're, you're giving them free therapy, and that's uh, – <laughs> It's, it's not something I have time or interest in. And I think it's, I mean, there is a point at which you just ask people a very clear question. And then if they provide a particular answer, there's just nothing you can do. So in, in my debate with him, I asked him, all right, well, you see all of these great institutions that you keep talking about. And he makes the case for Israel as a classical liberal society. And it, has, it says it's better than um, most of the world in so many different ways. So I asked him, well, you live in Louisiana. Why wouldn't you want to campaign for these same rules and laws that they have in the U.S., in Israel for Louisiana, for the U.S.? When are you going to hold an event at the Mises Institute that campaigns for government to only allocate land to people by renting, by leasing it to people from one religion? Why don't you propose that in the U.S.? Would you accept something like this being implemented in the U.S.? Why not? Uh, and if you don't, why would you accept it? in somebody else's home. Why Why should I live in a place where the government owns all the land and gives it to people from one religion, whereas you get to live in a place where you have a free market where anybody can use the land and anybody can buy it and sell it? And he just couldn't answer that. And he just said no. Um, he, he moved on to saying, you know, so some random platitudes, but ultimately, that I believe is just—it's clear. Yeah, it's 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 clear he's trying to think of ways of maintaining his kind of reputation, but it's very clear that he just does not think of somebody like me as a human being that deserves to live like him, and that just makes me free of any obligation to indulge him or his insanity or his uh, bloodthirstiness. Yeah, sorry for bringing that up. I don't know. That might be a sore topic for you. <laughs> oh, no, no, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. It's just uh, not something I think about so much anymore. And it's, and, yeah. he's, he's, he, and it's not a major loss. I mean, his work is in libertarianism. He's, he's like a libertarian shock jock. He's like the Howard Stern of libertarianism. He hasn't really <laughs> contributed much that's original. Um, his book, Defending the Indefensible, seems cool when you're an edgy college libertarian. But after you grow up a little bit and you read Hans Hermann Hoppe, you realize yeah. it's ridiculous. I mean, yeah. if people, the, the, you, you, I, I get the point that yes, you shouldn't initiate aggression against people engaging in behavior you might find morally reprehensible, but it does not follow that you have to accept that behavior in your community, that you want to associate with those people, that you need to associate with them. And so it's entirely reasonable for people not to want to associate with any of these oh, horrific things that he talks about. That, you know, um, he, he argues for the uh, libertarian case for uh, all kinds of horrific things like blackmail or uh, drug dealing or prostitution or so. All kinds of degeneracy. Yeah. Yeah. Degeneracy. Exactly. Degeneracy as if it is a libertarian ideal. And a lot of people have this idea, and I think it's a huge misconception. It's a huge misconception among libertarians and outside of libertarians because they think of libertarianism as being libertinism. And yes. then you read Hoppe and you grow up and you realize, no, it doesn't 
have to be that way. It doesn't follow. Just, okay, you can accept people's rights to do things with their body, but you also have the right not to want to associate with it. So there's no reason that as a libertarian, you should be out there uh, demanding that people put up with their neighbors uh, setting up uh, prostitution uh, businesses or with <laughs> their neighbors selling heroin on the sidewalk. People can choose to get into communities that are voluntarily right. based on rules of conduct that everybody abides by. Right. In fact, this is very interesting because this, in effect, was sort of the – you mentioned my libertarian campaign – for president, this this really was the rub uh, that uh, divided my my candidacy from what we call the LOL liber libertarians, the low, LOL libertarians, the uh, libertine libertarians, and that's what they ended up with uh, as their uh, candidate through ledger domain and other backroom sl slimy dealings. Um, but um, yeah, that that was a, a referendum on this kind of idea of libertarianism as sort of la total laissez-faire in terms of uh, accepting all kinds of degeneracy as normal, and uh, then you know saying, well, uh, the state the state shouldn't tell you that. Look, some people make this mistake. They say, well, the state tells you, the state is trying to tell you not to uh, trans your children. Uh, therefore, you should trans your children. That's like yeah. saying, well, the state's telling you not to murder people, therefore you should murder them. Or I mean, the state is telling you to take, uh, not to take heroin, so you should do heroin. <laughs> exactly. It that's not how that. this works. <laughs> they just don't get that. And it's that simple. But, you know, um, uh, that's, that's what I ran up against largely. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's really about the freedom to associate with things that you want. And I just don't get this idea that, oh, I mean, I think it works in the context, and this is why I think Walter Block's true understanding of libertarianism and freedom is lacking, because he's still arguing from the perspective of the um, debate club in high school, where you have the government out there locking up people for uh, smoking drugs and he's arguing against the government locking people up for smoking drugs and yeah we get it the government shouldn't be locking up nor um, peaceful people for doing that but that's not really the key idea the, the in the if you really want to think about a free society where it's no longer about a state it's about voluntary association between people in a truly free society why shouldn't people have the freedom to disassociate from conduct that they believe is destructive? And I think the key point that libertine libertarians miss is that it's not just a matter of personal taste, that some people like to do those things and we don't like to do those things, but it's fine, just let them do it. I think the really powerful argument that Hopper makes in Democracy, the God That Failed, is that Look, human society has been around for a very long time, and we know what works and we know what doesn't, and we know how certain behaviors pan out. And if you value the things that economic productivity can bring, if you value capital accumulation, if you value civilization, if you value peaceful conduct between people, it seems inevitable that you would need a family's unit for that. And it seems inevitable that you would want a society geared toward people wanting to have families and towards caring about the sustainability of the family in the long term. And in order to do that, in a free society, there need to be rules of association. Uh, I don't want to live in a house, uh, in a building or in a street or in a neighborhood where people are uh, dealing drugs out in the open. And so in the housing project that we build, we sign a contract that if you want to buy this house, you abide by these rules. And if you break those rules, there are specific conditions for it. I don't see why this is not libertarian. So I think this entire idea that you, um, as Walter Block does, uh, bring up these villains and then argue for their right. Yeah, of course, it's trivial to argue that uh, the government shouldn't tax other people in order to put uh, weed smokers into jail. But... Does a weed smoker or a cocaine dealer have an inherent right to live next to people who don't want to experience mm -hmm. that? I'd argue not. 
This podcast is brought to you by my friends at Coinbits, the oldest Bitcoin-only exchange. If you're listening to this podcast, you get that Bitcoin upends everything that government schools teach about money. Coinbits is the money app designed for people like you who understand Bitcoin and want to use it every day. Coinbits pioneered the concept of roundups, which converts your spare change into Bitcoin. Simply connect your debit and credit cards and your usual purchases are rounded up to the nearest dollar, letting you save more in Bitcoin as you spend more. My favorite new Coinbits feature is Spending Insights, which gives you real-time feedback about how much of your money is chasing high-time preference, short-term gratification, and how much you are providing for your future with low-time preference choices. As always, Coinbits provides a terrific self-custody experience. Connect a hardware wallet for automatic withdrawals, so you keep counterparty risk to a minimum. Coinbits also offers peer-to-peer -peer cash and Bitcoin payments, target orders, price alerts, and more. Coinbits can help you do almost anything you need with Bitcoin. Go to coinbits.app slash Saifedean and get three months free. Again, that is coinbits.app slash Saifedean, S-A-I-F-E-D-E-A-N. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by Orange Pill App, the Bitcoin-only social network that connects you with high-signal Bitcoiners, events, and now merchants as well. If you're like me and can't stop talking about Bitcoin, you know how challenging it can be to talk to the no-coiners and how nice it is to talk to someone who gets you. With the Orange Pill app, you can find the Bitcoiners near you and they can replace the no-coiners in your life. You can organize events and meetups with local Bitcoiners and wherever you travel, you can meet up with local Bitcoiners all while being as anonymous as you like. So if you want to build your local network of Bitcoiners, find a Bitcoin meetup or merchants accepting Bitcoin, head over to orangepillapp.com to sign up or download the app from the App Store or Google Play Store and send me a DM so we can get connected. Yeah, as I put it in uh, an essay that I wrote for actually a, a volume that Hop, uh, not, not Hop, uh, but Block co-edited, I said, I've become what I call a hip hopian. Um, I, <laughs> I believe with Hoppe that libertarianism is most compatible with cultural conservatism. conservatism. Property rights accord with the structures of a stable social order based on the household and vice versa. Uh, the prop protection of property both reinforces and is reinforced by a society based on natural, the natural order. And all forms of leftism involve attempts to uproot and destroy this natural order. I would agree. I think, remember when we were discussing the um, uh, leftism earlier at the beginning of this conversation, I was saying it's, uh, it's, it's out there undermining the fabric of society. And that means the family and means religion, tradition, aristocracy, monarchy. And these... We can vilify them based on the actions of those people because obviously every father has made a mistake, every king has made a mistake, every religious authority has some kind of infallibility. Uh, well, perhaps not uh, certain religious authorities, but I mean, at least their representatives on earth, they have some kind of uh, mistakes. And so the leftism is the art of throwing away the baby with the bath water. So there's something wrong mm -hmm. with the uh, monarchy. So then let's just destroy all uh, forms of organization Order. in society. Exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. A, there was a priest who did something bad. So let's destroy every single church and prosecute the people that are in the churches. And it's just, um, it's, it's, it's truly pernicious how destructive this is because it is destructive on a social level in the same way that it is destructive on an economic level where once you take away capital from people you destroy economic production you don't just take away, you don't just redistribute economic production from uh, rich people to poor people you destroy economic production because you don't have property rights yeah all together exactly all together yep absolutely and yeah. that's what they do yeah absolutely all right so then what about the great reset this was your latest uh, latest book right yeah so look everybody knows that this is uh, deemed a conspiracy theory and all that. So I, uh, I wanted to look at what exactly was going on and what were they attempting to do from the UN slash World Economic Forum slash global roundtable groups uh, that are all kind of precursors to the World Economic Forum, like the Club of Rome and the uh, Bilderbergs and the uh, 
Council on Foreign Relations and the RIIA, uh, the Chatham House Group and all that. So I, I did a deep dive into this. And uh, the Great Reset is, and, and I, the first part of the book really de- deals with the economics of it, uh, this so-called stakeholder capitalism, which is uh, really one way to understand this Great Reset is this idea of universalizing what they call stakeholder capitalism, which is just another way of uh, a, a controlled, central, centralized control of the economy using uh, this pretense of distributing wealth vis-a-vis corporations themselves, sort of hollowing out socialism from within the corporate world, uh, sort of liquidating corporations from within to distribute wealth through into these various stakeholders, um, the, you know, a la Larry Fink and BlackRock, and he's the leading edge of this stakeholder capitalism regime in real life, and not just a propagandist like Klaus Schwab and the WEF. They actually execute this stuff. So I went into the economics and I studied it. From, I examined it from different perspectives, like. Is it socialism? Is it fascism? Is it uh, is it uh, uh, ca- kind of Chinese uh, capitalism with Chinese characteristics uh, and so forth? And so I laid out all those possibilities, and it's all of those things really at once. And then I go into uh, a deep dive into the um, the roundtable groups from which the World Economic Forum emerged, inclusive of the um, uh, sort of the neo-Malthusianism of of, of such groups as the um, uh, the um, Club of Rome, and you know these people have been arguing for population control reduction and and so forth. So they want to control production, consumption, and reproduction. That that became very clear. And uh, so it is, a, um, it is a real thing, this uh, Great Reset. It's a real phenomenon. And then I, I examined at the end of the book the question of conspiracy theory from, you know, what is the epistemological status of, a conspir- of conspiracy theory per se? And I did this through philosophical discourse, uh, starting with Karl Popper, who really started this whole uh, – who started the idea that a conspiracy, the idea that conspiracy theory as an epithet, you know, that anything that was a conspiracy theory is necessarily um, mistaken and crazy, and and, and then uh, you know, then I went into the various philosophers about uh, who have treated this question, and you know, came out the other end. Of course, I kind of come out where Rothbard ended up. There are conspiracies. And the poo-pooing of conspiracy theory is one way of keeping these conspirators off the hook. And, um, you know, um, so uh, then I also treated like the fourth industrial revolution, all the technologies that are involved in attempting to keep the social order that they try to establish, they want to establish through this stakeholder capitalism in place, a kind of static hierarchy of total surveillance state uh, and uh, the kind of uh, datifying of all all organisms and even their internal activities, as in human beings, with the uh, Internet of Bodies, the Internet of Things, the digital ID, CBDCs, all of that I treat uh, in this book. Yeah, I think this is uh, this is obviously a very interesting. Uh topic and it's fascinating because you wrote a book called the great reset and uh, people would presume oh well that's just a crazy conspiracy theorist but there's another crazy conspiracy theorist who wrote an also a book published around the same time also called the great reset some fellow by the name of klaus schwab you ever, ever heard of him <laughs> that's correct <laughs> and and this this kooky tinfoil hat wearing guy has written this book apparently making such outlandish claims i mean if people thought you were a crazy conspiracy theorist this guy is so much wildly He's saying that governments are going to use the epi- the epidemic the covid-19 pandemic to 
implement all kinds of technologies for surveillance and to uh, implement all kinds of health policies from a top-down perspective. And that this is going to also help us reformulate all of our economies around those things. Mm -hmm. It's just completely yeah. wild out there stuff. I'm glad yeah. nobody listens to these conspiracy theories. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I took that book and just I, I took it apart and uh, and uh, fleshed out the implications of what he was saying. Uh, and he looked at COVID. And he said, uh, I counted the number of times that he called COVID nineteen an opportunity. Um, I think it was. Uh, upwards of 45 times in which he basically stated that the uh, COVID-19 represented this great opportunity to restructure the whole capitalist uh, order and the whole social order and the whole sort of biosphere, really, everything. Um, so, yeah, um, it's all there. And uh, so I did my best to stay grounded. It's, everything is very uh, detailed in terms of uh, – sourcing uh nothing is you know i don't make any wild conjectures it's all pretty much explicating what the hell they're saying you know yeah yeah and i think this is the, you're very correct on this uh, poo-pooing of conspiracy theory that just shuts people's brains off and i think it's uh it's ridiculous because of course conspiracies are always present anytime two people plan to do something that they right. don't tell other people about that's a conspiracy <laughs> that's right. If you've right. been part of a startup, it's a conspiracy. I mean, if it, uh, four people are getting together and they want to build a product so that they could make millions of dollars, they, they want to take millions of dollars from people, that's a conspiracy. People are always conspiring to do things. Right. The right. vast majority of things start off as conspiracies where people are not public about their intentions. And the vast majority of things that happen have had a conspiracy, or, or let's say the vast majority of bad things that happen have had a conspiracy behind them. In other words, a few weeks ago, somebody shot at Trump. There was a conspiracy there. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you think. Yeah. You're a conspiracy theorist. If you say anything about it, there's a conspiracy, a conspiracy theory. Because if it was just this guy on his own, well, he conspired with, well, maybe, or, well maybe if it was a lone gun, I guess it wasn't a conspiracy. You need more than one person to have a conspiracy, or you could have a one-person conspiracy. It's, if he's a schizophrenic or multi-personality. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, a lot of these things happen, and obviously somebody's behind them. Several people were planning them in many cases. Right. And then it's just about different interpretations of which conspiracy is the one that uh, took place. But it's amazing that one, one, one conspiracy gets chosen as the legitimate story, and then everything right. else is just conspiracy That's right. theory. Yeah, I've come to think of... Uh, there's plenty of conspiracy theories. Some are just not approved. Um, so uh, in the case of uh, the Great Reset, the irony is it's not a conspiracy because it's an open, avowed plan. Uh, they're very open about what they're trying to do. Um, I think it definitely is going to fail because it can't work. It's, it, it runs into the same problems that socialism runs into. You can't centrally control the economy. You can't centrally plan uh, all human behavior. Uh, you cannot possibly um, consign people to uh, a kind of static hierarchy that they would like to impose. It's not possible over a long period. Yeah. What do you think of the idea, though, if I were to play devil's advocate here, is, well, if people stop owning property and people themselves become property, then this form of socialism maybe is workable. In other words, if you are no longer an economic actor because you're not allowed to make economic decisions because you get your uh, bugs delivered straight to your apartment and you get your <laughs> slop rations delivered right into your veins through a central tunneling of slop uh, mechanism across society, and you're sitting there and you're just consuming what the TV tells you and you're leaving the house at the times that they tell you. I mean, in this kind of extreme form, in a sense, the socialist calculation problem probably doesn't apply anymore in the same way that uh, it doesn't apply in a farm because, yeah. that, because the cows don't have property and they don't need to make any calculations. Yes, that's correct. That's a good point. Um, if you have a totalizing system where you derationate the population so that they don't have any uh, consumer choices because they don't have choice, 
because they don't have a modus uh, operandi of choice, uh, once they have no longer have an impetus to do anything uh, that represents a choice, then effectively you have a slave colony. And uh, that, that's kind of what they would like to impose. And they use ideology for this. And they also intend on using technology to bring that kind of situation about. Um, I mean, this guy, Yo, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, suggests that, you know, we can hack human beings so that free will, so to speak, and this gets into philosophical questions about free will. Free will is over, as he put it. Uh, we can hack you. And likewise, basically remote control human beings uh, through technology, I guess through brain cloud interfacing. Uh, they can take control of your neurons and decide what you do and what you don't do. And even your thoughts could be intercepted. I mean, it's, it's theoretically possible. I'm not saying it's technically possible, but theoretically that does pose Well, I mean, I think uh, if you believe, it's one of those things where if you believe it, then it's true. And if you don't believe it, then it's not true, I would say. Because we live in a world in which a lot of people's yeah. thought process has been hijacked. I think uh, we thought in the early days of the internet, yeah. I think it was hugely liberating for so many people that the a lot of the early internet pioneers being people who got into the internet early because they're very smart, they thought of the liberating potential. They thought, yeah, and they thought, you know, these uh, people are going to have access to information and there's no way to stop information. And then uh, it's going to be a liberating thing. But I think the last few years, as you write, showed us that uh, <laughs> Twitter's not that much better than uh, CBS and CNN. Because ultimately, when push comes to shove, when, you know, they, uh, well, when the pandemic happened, when uh, climate change discussion comes up, when the uh, Gaza war starts, there's a clear party line that is repeated in CNN, New York Times, and all regime media. But also, there's a clear party line mm -hmm. in social media. And I think, you know, Twitter, uh, X now is a mm -hmm. lot better. Twitter was worse. But still, even the old days, Twitter was always the hardest to uh, censor, I would say. But like, if you look at Facebook, it's just... It's a, it's a complete uh, AI bot world. It's, it really is. Yeah, it really, it really is a great point in the support of what Harari says. And I think at this point, Facebook is largely low IQ people yelling at AI generated content and telling it it's doing a great job or how could you or how dare you. <laughs> and they're just looking at fake images generated by uh, <laughs> AI. And it's uh, because I think Facebook has done a terrific job of absolutely censoring any kind of intelligent discussion of anything that matters. Uh, I, I, I don't post on Facebook and I haven't for a very, very long time because it's uh, anytime you try and post and talk about anything that's yeah, interesting or intelligent, way. it immediately shuts it down. So I think there is, I don't know, maybe, maybe, the, maybe we're overestimating um, how much free will people have because a lot of people seem to be going along with this. And I would say, it's the technology, but I would also add the diet, it's the nutrition. Everybody's out there malnourished. They're mm -hmm. eating garbage all the time. They're not eating enough meat. They're yeah. not getting enough animal fat. Right. And if you don't agree with me, right. you probably are malnourished yourself and you don't get enough meat and fat and eat too much junk. <laughs> no, I'm a carnivore. Big oh, time. <laughs> you are. Excellent. Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. I could show you my freezer. It's full. Of okay, great, great. Yeah, no, I wasn't referring to you. I was saying just in general. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pe pe people who generally disagree with this sentiment don't know how much uh, better their life would be if they ate a lot more meat and fat and a lot less junk. Um, but I think it's, uh, I mean, once you, tr once you've tried that, you, your brain clears up to a point and looking back at what it was like when you were eating garbage, I think, yeah, you are ripe for being commandeered intellectually. <laughs> Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that, uh, may at least save a remnant at the very least is what I've argued in this book actually at the end is that. At the very mo at the very least, what we can hope for is a remnant. And uh, one of the things that I one of, one of the main technologies for maintaining this remnant are are the 
volumes sitting behind you and me, books. Um, I think books actually, uh, books are, are a repository of knowledge and uh, perspectives that uh, can't be de- can't be erased uh, necessarily. Uh, so um, as long as we have books, I-, I know that sounds like a bibliophile. I sound like a bibliophile saying that, but I don't care. It's I think books are massive uh, ballast against this. Absolutely. Of course, we're biased because we're in the book business. We're writers. <laughs> uh, full disclosure, we both sell and books. And speaking of books, I, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying yours. Uh, oh, yeah, which one? The Bitcoin Standard. It's like a history of money. Uh, I didn't expect it to be such a history of money, but it's an amazing history of money. Where I really like it a lot. Thank you. One of my good friends, when I wrote this book and we first started reading, he's like, okay, so all of your crazy ideas, you just use Bitcoin as a Trojan horse to spread your crazy ideas about economics <laughs> in the world. I was like, yeah, I think you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, no, there's uh, the history is wonderful. I, uh, that, that's, that's the precursor to what you're getting at. And uh, I think that's necessary to set up the, 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 you know, the contrast that you're posing with Bitcoin. I think you got to grasp the history of money in order to understand this. Absolutely. So what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, look, I'm not an aficionado. Um, but my thoughts are this. Um, and I said this in my campaign, and uh, I think that we need uh, a parallel currency to... Um, Erode the, uh, the the Fed's monopoly on money, and uh, that we need uh, that the only uh, recourse to maintaining uh, liberty actually is required to have we 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 we're, we necessarily must have uh, a free market um, currency, and I think Bitcoin represents that possibility. Yeah, absolutely. I think it really is the answer to all of these issues that you discuss in the discussion of the Great Reset, because fundamentally, ultimately, all of this stuff falls apart if you control your own money. If you control your own money, you'll still be able to eat the food that will keep you mentally uh, powerful enough to understand what's going on. You'll still be healthy. You'll be able to have your life. You'll be able to buy the things that you want. And... Uh, a lot of their bullshit breaks down. And I think on on an individual level, you protect yourself with Bitcoin, but then um, hate using this term because it comes from the pseudoscience of epidemiology. But if enough people (laughs) use Bitcoin, then we develop a sort of herd immunity to uh, uh, all of this garbage because we take away from them the power of the money printer. And that's what it ultimately comes down to. So I th- really yeah. think it's very easy to get despondent and to s- focus on all the ways in which technology is imprisoning humans and reducing our liberty. But I think it's also very powerful yeah. to understand that every technology can be used by the attacker and the defender. Yeah, absolutely. And instead of worrying about uh, how they're going to use their weapons against you. It's time for you to start thinking about your own weapons. And Bitcoin Absolutely. really is the best one that you can use because it's 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 all about the money and ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. And I say that at the end of the book, uh, The Great Reset and the Struggle for Liberty. We must have it in place prior to the rollout of a CBDC. Uh, it has to be in place and in use well before that or else we're, f- excuse my language. Well, Bitcoin's in place and it's been in use for 15 years. And right. uh, people have already used it to escape their uh, hyperinflationary currencies from their high inflationary environments, from their low inflation. It protects you from surveillance uh, if you, you know how to use it properly and it protects you, right. from, most importantly, from inflation. That's the thing. So it is out there. I think it's just... A greater circle of adoption is necessary yeah. in order to fend off the... Uh, the CBDC, which is the end of liberty altogether. Indeed, absolutely. But it's already here, so it's just about yes, people. Right. I think it really is it's, it's a matter of understanding. A lot of people um, just don't get what the problem they're up against is. And when yeah. they get the problem, a lot of them are just so invested in uh, this victimhood of woe is me, they're out to get me, that uh, they fail to see the giant escape hatch 
leading straight to a rocket ship. <laughs> we could get them out Absolutely. of this mess. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree yeah. 100%. All right. Well, where else? Um, what else uh, can you tell us about your work and where people can find you? Yeah. So, I mean, I keep a repository of my work at michaelrechtenwald.com. Michaelrechtenwald.com, no H, no K. But I'm also now writing on Substack. So you can find me there at mrechtenwald.substack.com, where I'm now posting my, you know, my mo more daily uh, thoughts. And, uh, and, and I'm also working on a couple books. One is a novel, uh, one is a memoir, and another one is a sort of history of social engineering. And, uh, yeah, so I, I keep a lot of balls in the air, but I don't start anything I don't finish. Uh, that's been my motto and my mo for some time so if i say i'm writing a novel there'll be a novel <laughs> well i look forward to reading it i look forward to reading the one on social engineering that's a highly relevant topic in today's world michael rector thank you so much for your time and for this wonderful conversation and uh keep up uh, keep doing what you're doing thank you so much it's great to be here cheers take care mm -hmm.